long time ago, some hairy character painted blue slung down the carcass of a recently slain stag, grunted, this is the spot, and told his wife to build a house. Before she even finished pouring the mud floor, distant relatives were already arriving, and since then, nobody has ever gone home again except the Roman army and the German air force. Casual visitors live their whole adult lives here, wondering why they never went back where they came from. But all they ever do is write a postcard. Thirty years ago, very few Australians actually flew into London. But thousands of them arrived by coach, coming up from the ships in Southampton sobbing with relief after a five-week journey so soporific that even those neo-Elizabethan pebble-dash semi-detached suburbs looked exciting. Raised on a diet of Ealing comedies, I expected to see Margaret Rutherford beating Alastair Sim over the head with a rolled-up umbrella. It all looked like a film set. It still does. We got off the coach in Earl's Court, where nothing much has changed except one thing. Me. I've changed. In those days, I had hair and a waist, but no income. Looking for somewhere to live, I used to spend a lot of time walking. What with the traffic and the current state of the public transport system, walking is still the quickest way of getting about. You can do it for the price of shoe leather, but the price of a place to lay your head has gone off the clock. I used to think that three pounds a week for a room of your own was a lot. Now it seems to cost ten times as much, even if you allow for what's happened to the money which has retained no more value than the shoes I was wearing at that period. Also, you nowadays have to share a room, which, considering the socks I was wearing at the period, would have made life impossible. How do the kids do it? Maybe they don't. We did it by teaming up to rent a flat near Olympia. I haven't been back here for years, but the place has lost none of its charm. In fact, the house looks better now. We lived on the top floor. There were five of us who were all going to be writers and film directors or starve in the attempt. Meanwhile, the landlady was waiting for the rent with outstretched talons. There was no getting away from her. She had a filing system for our fingerprints, mug shots and IOUs. Later we learned that she disappeared the day after we did and resurfaced in Brazil as a dog handler for one of the great train robbers. They didn't know how much history they were destroying when they flattened this area. Somewhere about here, there was a greasy spoon called Wally's, where we lunched every day on Sam Fritters and Spotted Dick with Custard because it was the only meal Wally had learned to cook in Colditz. A bit later on, a struggling young actress and I shared a bed here in Islington. We were helplessly driven by an unspoken need. The guilty party was our landlord. On the nights when I was away playing some doomed date in a provincial drill hall, he would move Victoria Wood into my bed and vice versa. Why were you sleeping in my bed, Victoria? Well, I want to say I didn't know it was your bed, okay? I was told that it was my room, and I didn't know that a hot Australian body was slipping between the sheets every other Thursday or whenever it was. And I'm sorry I left my knickers in your bed. I thought it was my bed, and I think you should apologize for throwing them away. Well, I, I know you've been spreading this story that I found these things but well, actually I framed them. <laughs> We're going to have them back. How do you actually come to be visiting my room? I have no business to be here. I never had had. I was living in a bed sitter in Birmingham, and a television producer, a lady, phoned up and said, I want you to come to Claridge's offices tomorrow morning. And I didn't say, who are you and why do you want me to come? Because I, I was very obedient in those days, and I just came. And she had a job for me with two people who lived in that house. Well, what were you doing? You were sort of, were you tickling the ivories while I they... I was playing the piano while they died the death in sort of various funny hats, making various obscure medical references. But uh, I was not over most of the time in those years, but so how, I can't quite remember how we eventually met. Well, I just remember seeing you sitting in your trousers with nothing else on, having suntan oil rubbed into your back by two New Zealand nurses. I deny everything. <laughs> it's true. As I vaguely remember, 
the sort of male chauvinist animal house. Remember? Yeah, so they used to bring a lot of nurses in, didn't they? That's what I remember, that there was lots of gorgeous women hanging about, and I felt like a sort of lorry. Really? <laughs> yes. The picture you're painting doesn't correspond with <laughs> my, my remembrance of reality in any way. Was living in Gibson Square your first and most horrifying experience of living in London? No, I'd lived in a bit in Finsbury Park with my boyfriend. He shared a room with his brother, and if we wanted to sleep together, we had to pay him to sleep on the living room floor. Did you were coming down from the north? Yes, from, we used to come from Birmingham on the coach. In fact, one day I arrived at Victoria Coach Station, he wasn't there to meet me, so I phoned my father in Manchester and went straight home on the coach, because I didn't know how to get to Finsbury Park on the tube. When you finally got to Finsbury Park, what did you find? What was the flat like? Well, it was just one massive, huge Victorian room, and a tiny kitchen full of margarine, and it was like J.P. Don Levy. They used to pick up their socks and smell them, whichever smelled the least bad they used to put on. And that they never, ever wash their sheets. And if you ever go in a room where two boys have never, ever washed their sheets, it's like Rivita. I mean, their sheets were like Rivita, but it's just very my, my sheets used to look like... I think it would be very, very wise, actually, for someone to manufacture grey sheets for young men. <laughs> it's grey stiff sheets. Finance was a big problem about living in London, wasn't it? We never had any money. I never had any money, because I was on the dole for four years after I was at, at university. I didn't work, mainly because I did one night with two mad doctors and, you know, was seen by the British press and exposed for being a talentless brat. Has London changed much? I don't think it's changed. I think you, you change yourself, and you, if you get more money, then you go to nicer bits of it. But it's all still going on, you know. Earning a living gradually detached me from one of London's chief benefits. Being broke, you see the sights. Some of the best shows are free. Fired after being found asleep during my first night as a night watchman, rejected for the position of trainee municipal rat catcher, I could console myself with the changing of the guard. There were far fewer tourists then. Now, it's the United Nations General Assembly on a camping trip. To get a good position, you have to stand on a child. But the show itself is unaltered in every detail. It just goes on forever, like that West End hit No Sex, Please, We're British, that King Henry VIII went to on opening night. I was a radical when I was young. Preaching a classless society and the equal redistribution of the Queen's money among working people such as myself I was inclined to find all this older role pretty ludicrous. The British class system was laid bare by the way the soldiers were covered up. Poor, wizened, potato-fed creatures, they had tall hats to make them look taller, but none of them were allowed to be as tall as the officers, who had tailored uniforms and kept passing little love notes to each other. You got son, he's it. On the outskirts of empire, I had been brought up sucking lead soldiers, and perhaps my bloodstream was affected. Eventually, your real feelings come through, if you are honest with yourself. Now, I can no longer keep secret from myself the surge of comfort at seeing something so trad. But in those days, I took it for granted that the British social system was on its way down the drain. Plenty of British people seem to think the same way, especially in London. The swinging 60s, universally greeted as a revolution. On Saturday mornings, we would all rush down to Chelsea to see how the revolution was going. Mad clothes made headlines then. Things seem to have calmed down a bit since. I can remember when you would see photographers lying on the footpath waiting for miniskirts to pass overhead. But shock value can last only so long. The revolution became a trend, which became a uniform, which became passé. Now people just seem to wear what they feel like. Only the builder's labourers still look as if they're trying to get their picture in the papers. Most of the King's Road action now is on four wheels. The hotbed of social upheaval has turned into a showroom for upmarket topless motors. The revolution made money. It was always going to. For those of us shivering in cold bed sits, the Cockney photographers like Terence Donovan looked as if they had taken over the country. 
starting out with nothing except a Dougie Haywood suit, a second-hand Hasselblad, and a dazzling line of chat. Donovan photographed beautiful women and made millions. What's galling is 30 years later, he's still doing it. I've got none of that, that terrible uh, middle-class masochism about the embarrassment of owning things that are pleasant. And Nikon cameras never cause me an embarrassment. Rolls-Royce has never caused me embarrassment. It sometimes irritates other people. And I've had occasionally had to get out and have a quiet word with somebody. But generally speaking, if you're not embarrassed by it, you can enjoy it. What is it about London that, that keeps you here, Terence? I think mainly because it's such a private place, you know. I mean, you can do what you like in London, provided you don't do anything illegal. Nobody really calls you any aggravation. And I think it's the eccentricity of the English that I like, you know. It's true. Sometimes in London, you know, things look a little bit more grubby than they should do. But I still love it to death. And as uh, Max Bilbaum was once asked, what did you do in London? He said, I walk about a bit and sometimes I take a taxi. And I kind of feel that way, really. Donovan has a business empire to run now. His job looks like absolute hell. I don't envy him a bit. But he can remember a time when London was a lot more free and easy. It was very cheerful in the 60s. It was, you know, things are much more lively. You could do anything you like. Nobody cared very much. It's much more serious now. And much more, um, much more at stake. And the thing is that uh, if you wanted to set up shop as a brain surgeon, nobody worried too much, you know what I mean? You could do what you liked. I can remember when the miniskirt came in. I suppose you were partly responsible. Well, the miniskirt was quite a nightmare, really, because I spent most of that time in the 60s driving up the pavement. I mean, it was very disturbing um, driving along, seeing all these women wearing very short skirts because you you know it was seriously tricky and um, I thought it was magic you know anything that cheers the world up that makes people feel a bit more hopeful I'm all for <laughs> no matter how rough things get Donovan always looks on the bright side of life in Trafalgar Square I tried to do the same this was the first time I had walked there since the shadows came second in the Eurovision Song Contest I'd been around it in buses, then taxis, and then chauffeured Volvos on the way to frightfully important appointments, aware all the time that I should stop and do some of those wonderful, heartwarming, spontaneous open-air things that people in Trafalgar Square do, such as riot against the poll tax, jump into the fountains, or feed those friendly pigeons. Force-fed with skips full of free seed by millions of doting punters year after year, the pigeons, some experts say, will soon evolve into a non-flying variety who just sit there with a napkin around their necks. So if I ever wanted to feed them, now is the time. With the odd pigeon fluttering on my arm, I would be a man at peace with himself, having come far, seen much, and regained at last his inner simplicity. Too late, I realized that my fleeting resemblance to Alfred Hitchcock was enough to convince some veteran bit players from the birds that the great days of all the human flesh they could eat had returned. But the experience had got me back to nature. I was grateful. Would-be writers who come to London always have a Soho phase, but I didn't begin mine until Peter Cook finished his. No, I always remember going left to this. In the 60s, when he started Private Eye and the establishment satirical nightclub, Soho revolved around him while the rest of us looked on enviously from a distance, and previous Soho headliners were driven to the wall. Good heavens. There we have it. Karl Marx now moves to North London. I wonder what he would have made of it all. Well, he, he had a very harsh life here, Clive, you know. He had a very yeah. harsh life, had no money. He's entirely supported by Engels. Yeah. The coin of Engels used to arrive through the post, which kept uh, writing potential bestsellers like Das Kapital. Das Kapital, yes. I think that was Engels' idea in any case. Yeah. Well, do Das Kapital, you used up enough of mine. Whereas if you'd waited another 110 years, 
he could be... He, well, he would have been an Annabelle every night, wouldn't exactly. he? Exactly. Or, or Tramp, maybe. Uh, yes, indeed. As its name satirically suggested, the establishment was an anti-establishment establishment. Lenny Bruce flew in from America to help the local wits challenge the values of the upper classes who all turned up to watch. Now the abrasive voice of satire is only an echo, and Cook's old rostrum is someone else's restaurant. He finds it hard to suppress a sob of nostalgia as he reminisces. What was up here? Up here was a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> there are comedy clubs all over the place now. Yet when you started this one, it was actually a risk, wasn't it? Well, I, I didn't think it was a risk at all. I, my dread in my last year at Cambridge was that somebody else would have this very obvious idea to do a political cabaret, um, uncensored by the Lord Chamberlain. And I thought it was a, a certainty, especially when it's the only good title I've ever thought of. I think the establishment is a very good name. Um, and that was my only worry, and it was financed by people joining it before, before it opened. You better tell our younger audience uh, what the Lord Chamberlain was, because they don't know. Well, I wasn't quite sure either. Um, he was a, a man who could send out any stage play or anything that was produced on the stage. And I remember him objecting to the angle of a ladder that was brought on in some play at the Royal Court. He said it couldn't be at that angle, it had to be either there or there. <laughs> and then um, Beyond the Fringe, we, we had a sketch where we played um, about... Um, cigarette advertising and the opening line on, in the text said enter, enter three terrible old queens and that was censored uh, so we changed it to enter three aesthetic young men and that was all right <laughs> the journalist did a lot of talking about the london equivalent of la dolce vita he went on there were a few fist fights so uh, members of the audience got upset from time to time especially when uh, lenny bruce was on i remember one wonderful evening, very upper class couple were there with their daughters and they sat through every four letter word in the in the world and suddenly um, Lenny mentioned the word cancer on the shout of Fiona, Caroline, Deborah, cancer, out, out, and they all, all st stormed out. <laughs> Did you get involved in any fights yourself? I, I never fought. We, um, I was once hit round the, the face with a, by a handbag. Um, <laughs> Siobhan McKenna was upset about something. I think being asked to leave was what upset her. And, uh, she was an Irish... Uh, an Irish actress uh, of a fiery temperament and a great stage presence, and a great <laughs> off-stage presence as well. I, was, I, I thought I was ushering her politely towards the door, and she, her handbag whisked out and caught me around the chops. And she said, these are Irish hands and they're clean. And I said, it's an English face and it's bleeding. Not particularly funny, but... Uh, is all I could think of saying. When you started the club, what sort of people came? I remember the Cray twins came round when we were just about to open, and uh, they said, oh, it's a very nice place you've got here with uh, a lot of lighting and a lot of projection equipment and so on. It'd be dreadful, wouldn't it, if, if the wrong element came in and started uh, smashing the place up. And uh, we were willing to put people on the door to keep those types of element out because we know these elements and we can keep them out and I knew perfectly well that they were indeed the element that I didn't want to have in and uh, so I said well thank you very much it was very kind of you but the police are just around the corner and if there's any trouble I'm sure we'll call them and they'll do their best never saw them again <laughs> Nowadays, on a summer evening, the stretch of turf between Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus is full of youngsters from all over the world, slowly realising that all they've got to look at is each other. They are drawn there by the legend of swinging London, little knowing that in those days it was an indoor city. The streets were empty. The action was inside nightclubs you couldn't afford to go into, called after the sort of girls you couldn't afford to meet, with names like Annabelle. If you weren't in it, you felt out of it. Now there's a lot more for the poor, and those who don't make the mistake of buying more than one hot dog from a street vendor will have enough change, 20 quid, to go dancing. A young man from The Hague named Hoog gave me directions to an all-night rave-up at a place he called the Hip Dome. I was almost there before I realized he meant the Hippodrome. Called at various times the Hippodrome and the talk of the town, 
It stands in the Charing Cross Road district, where I used to haunt the second-hand bookshops on my numerous days off. Most of the second-hand bookshops were driven out when the rent went up, and the talk of the town told the second-hand girls in the cabaret to ditch the ostrich plumes, changed its name back to the Hippodrome, rewired itself for amplified music, and hired a lady announcer who, on the night I attended, was suffering from a throat condition and had to whisper. A young man from Hong Kong called Chong told me in sign language that she's usually a lot louder than that. But just when my ears had recovered to the point where I could hear them ringing, the music started. It was agony. I hadn't been in a place remotely like this since I wore winkle pickers and had a bad accident when one of them punctured my partner's thigh-high white PVC boot while we were twisting to Jerry and the pacemakers. In those days, you could hear the girls scream. A quarter of a century later, I couldn't hear myself think. It's no mystery why London is home for the whole world's youth. There's no language barrier. for sensory deprivation was still arriving as I left, wondering vaguely whatever happened to Jerry. Maybe he's got a pacemaker. After a night of putting eye drops in my ears, I restored my sanity with a pilgrimage. The National Gallery was one of the first places I headed for when I got to London, and until five years ago, before I got too busy, I was here once a month. Well, ten years ago, once every six months. Okay, 15 years ago. But honestly, I was here a lot. It was the best free show in town, and still is. In Sydney, these famous paintings have been a few inches across and buried in a book. In London, they're as big as they were painted. Botticelli's Mars and Venus was one of my first favorites. Living alone in a series of freezing bed sitting rooms, unwarmed by the presence of women, I envied Mars, his knockout girlfriend. While the cherubs played with his discarded armor, she waited patiently for him to come round so that she could knock him out again. Whatever Victoria Wood might say now, very little of this was happening where I was living. I was a single man in a world full of couples. Gainsborough painted these two. Hooray Henry had married Hooray Henrietta. Clearly, they would have had any servant caught stealing a bread crust transported to Botany Bay in chains but I once envied them for having each other and three square meals a day and no rent payments outstanding. The splendor on the walls was a constant reminder that my private life was a disaster area. But in the Spanish section, I finally found the only girl in the gallery who was on her own, the Rokeby Venus. Lately, she's been cleaned up and glows too brightly for my taste. I remember when she was just a shape through a haze brown varnish and red-eyed lust. She's in the right city. In Madrid, she would have spent half her life locked up. Not even Velasquez approved of nude paintings, and he painted her. He should have lived in London, spent his evenings at Raymond's Review Bar, and given free rein to his instincts. That, at any rate, was my opinion when I first stood here transfixed, like a wagon load of wild oats with a broken axle. When I finally did get a job, it was here. The destination I dreamed of in Australia, Fleet Street, looks like nothing now. The great newspapers have moved out, away from trade unions and the obsolete technology that used to clatter and bang expensively behind the overwrought facades. The old raffish excitement is all wrapped up. The interiors are being gutted to make room for the quiet patter of computer keyboards operated by accountants in clean suits who have dedicated their lives to boring facts. The old Daily Express never let the facts spoil a good story. 
Even people who despise the paper admired its building, which has been preserved as an Art Deco masterpiece. In the basement, the presses are still there. It's only a few months since they stopped, and already the hot grease that helped them turn has turned cold and clogged them shut. Soon, they'll be gone, broken up for scrap metal to make anti-personnel mines for the developing countries. Imagine the uproar as they churned out every day those miles and miles of flapdoodle, all poised somewhere between uplift and outright lies. The clamor, the glamour, gone without a glimmer. But the sculpted foyer still conjures up the far-flung days of empire when Daily Express reporters with names like Septon Delmer arrived every few minutes by taxi brandishing expense account claims even more unbelievable than their stories. For anyone who spent the best part of his life first breaking into Fleet Street and then clinging on to some piece of it as it all fell apart, this is a shrine. In case the preservation order doesn't work and they bulldoze the place during the night, I have made a date with my fellow Fleet Street veteran Alan Corrin to worship here just one more time. Everybody has to have a celestial city. You knew what it was. It was Fleet Street. It was the best there was in the world. Um, England calls its newspapers provincial or Fleet Street, not provincial or metropolitan, not provincial or London. It's provincial or Fleet Street. And Fleet Street meant not provincial. It meant you made it. It meant you'd come off the Bolton Times Picayune and come here, and you were the best there was. Because Americans came, even the French, even the grudging French would come and say we had the best newspapers in the world. And the idea of coming in every morning to the best place in the world. I mean, it was, it's like Janet Gaynor, it's like a star is born. They want to get to Hollywood. I mean, you don't want to go to make your films in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. You want to get to Hollywood, or you want to get to Broadway. You want to see Times Square. All cities have areas of attraction, and uh, those areas of attraction which are about professions are the most exciting ones of all. I loved it when I got here, because it was so like the way it was supposed to be, with all these characters with names like Chapman, Pincher. You know, and they were that I'm a Squire Barraqua. You have a Ladislav Farrago was my favorite. Ladislav Farrago was a bloke on, the, on this very paper, on the Daily Express, who discovered Martin Bormann in Argentina. That's right, but except the guy's ears were in the wrong place. Oh, yes. Then he discovered him in Colombia. I think he discovered two or three of them in Manchester. But Ladislav Farrago <laughs> pursued bogus Martin Bormanns around the world. And you thought, <laughs> is he the real Ladislav Farrago? Or was Martin Bormann sitting somewhere saying, I think I saw someone called Ladislav Farrago. And we were like, get off it, Martin. Um, yes, they had dark names. And you meet these guys in the office, except at lunchtime, which lasted a long time, as I remember. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing that's changed, of course. Not simply their physical transposition somewhere else, but they, they, their dietary habits. Journalists don't drink as much as they used to because they're not with one another and they don't encourage one another. Uh, and things are different now. It's a lettuce leaf and a, and a squirt of sweet puree and, and a Perrier water. So I can remember those blokes. I don't want to romanticize it. Most of them are. Their livers have been buried elsewhere with the <laughs> tiny etiolated limbs around these huge livers which have eaten their whole body. Um, but they sat in El Vino's or the Harrow, or, and they just drank and drank and drank till the lights went out. Theirs often. Uh, wonderful. But you enjoyed them because it, there was that community of, um, of wickedness and mischievousness that was fueled by booze. They got better as they got drunker. They started off in the, you went in at 12 o'clock, and they were quite serious blokes, gossiping about their bosses by about three. With all the stories that, wasn't, that weren't fit to print. My old newspaper's got a new building at Battersea, and I went out there for the first time the other day, and I was struck by the silence. I thought, where are the journalists? They're there somewhere, but you can't really tell anymore. The noise is gone. Uh, print machinery is quiet. When the presses began to run at the sun, and we were, quarter of a mile away down Bouverie Street, the entire place shook. You know, people's dentures dropped out and stuff began to, it was like a hint of a, of a war coming. It was like an advance of, of, uh, of armor. Everything shook. You felt that noise. You felt the noise of manual typewriters. You felt the noise of um, all kinds of shouting. You actually felt that physically. People made so much noise shouting for copy boys and all the rest. Constant buzz. How you work through it, I don't know. But, insofar as I don't know that, I don't know how they work in silence now, because I can't. I keep away from newspaper offices, because I, you know, I write for the Times and the Mail most. If I go in there and they, they say, well, you know, sit down and type something, 
I can't do it. This is extraordinary hush. Talking about how things used to be is one of London's unchanging attractions. Another is the park, a hundred parks. Even when summer parches the grass, London is still green. I should go out into Hyde Park more often. It's years now since I would come here during the week to lie down for a couple of days and try to figure out why they hadn't given me that job burning used banknotes at the Mint or guarding Jean Shrimpton. London is a city of lawns with dusty edges, loamed and pummeled by the hooves of well-fed horses from mews that were never converted into bijou dwellings. 2,000 packets of crisps in the past, I used to sit on this bench and wonder how to meet her, the city-dwelling country girl, Lady Caroline Withering Scornforth. There she goes again. She hasn't changed a bit in all this time. She still looks as if she can get off that thing except to step into a Range Rover, but I realize now that I'm being unfair. Let people do what they want, as long as it doesn't frighten the horses. The tube hasn't changed much, which is part of its trouble. In Paris and Moscow and Tokyo, the trains run one after another. In the London Underground, they run occasionally. Full of Norwegians with rucksacks walking back to the previous station from the train that broke down yesterday, the tatty system is continually being tarted up to look trite. In these respects, Oxford Street is its natural outlet. Oxford Street is a pretty down-market experience nowadays. But on the whole, Oxford Street was a pretty down-market experience even then. What's changed is that it used to be a British down-market experience, and now it's a more international one. Oxford Street could be in Singapore if it had less litter, Saudi Arabia if it had fewer thieves, Saskatoon if it had more things you actually wanted to buy. Most people who go there are tourists, and this is the main memory of London they will take away leaving nothing behind but their money. And yet still patrolling this mile of nothing is a true London eccentric. Stanley Green warns us that unless we cut down on our intake of protein, our passions will overwhelm us and the world will come to an end. He's been saying this all the time I've been in London and the world hasn't ended yet, but a man who spends a lot of his time in Oxford Street can be forgiven for thinking that it already has. Are you a man of fashion yourself? Not, not now, Miss. I'm, uh, well, <laughs> I'm managing my fashion. Put ah. it that way. Yeah, how do you do it? Well, if you one is too passionate, one's eating too much of those foods. Too much food? Which, yeah. Too much of those particular foods, which, oh, right. which are rich in protein. Uh-huh. Too much protein, too much passion. That's right. Mm. Uh, well, this way, I always say, if you're, if you're too passionate, you're eating too much of those foods. Yeah. That tells people that they can't eat those foods. Right. But if they're too passionate, they're going, having too much. You certainly identified the problem. I don't know if you've got the solution. Oh, it is a solution. Yeah. Oh, this will help. This, this can fail. The mm. person's intentions are right. They'll, get in, they'll, they'll improve themselves. Yeah. And they'll, they'll find a great change in themselves. Yeah. I've always meant to stop and talk to Stanley. In most of the world's capital cities, he would be under the poverty line, under surveillance, or under arrest. In London, he's got a full-time job as a weirdo. It took me a long time to find out that you can't necessarily hope for anything more in life, and London had to teach me. Those born there get the idea with their mother's milk. Some of the people that come down Oxford Street aren't so nice anymore. They've got pickpockets and all kinds of people. Oh, yes, that's quite true. And the, the, the worst of them, as far as I'm concerned, are those who have a drink or two inside them. Uh -huh. I don't like me. <laughs> what do they do? Well, I have to be careful of those people. They try to get my board away from me sometimes, uh -huh. but uh, so far I've been lucky. I've managed to hang on to it. <laughs> Where do they all come from, these people? They're not all English, are they? No, I think a lot of them are tourists. Yeah. When they come to London, I don't know. <laughs> they must be part of me. <laughs> <laughs> The problem Stanley has never addressed is the passion for protein. It took me several years in television before I could summon up the courage to eat at Langan's in Mayfair. Langan himself was as nutty as one of his own salads with a self-destructive streak which was eventually successful. But one of the restaurant's remaining owners is in fine fettle. The year he became a star in the Ipcress file, I was still eating Ipcress. 
He's a protein-consuming cockney whose appreciation of the good things of life began when they weren't available. No, I, I, um, I did odd jobs and stuff uh, as a young actor. I did all sorts of jobs. Um, I worked, uh, I used to make um, apple pies at night at, at um, Lyons in uh, Hammersmith and uh, donuts. I used to make donuts with 200 of uh, new West Indian immigrants, right? It's when the West Indians first came. They used to call me Sanders at the river up there. <laughs> this was their name for me, Sanders. There was some, yeah, with some funny tricks which I won't go into, but put it this way, I, I don't eat donuts to this day. Especially the ones with the holes in the middle. <laughs> in the days when you had no money at all, where did you eat then? Nick the Greeks in Soho, you could get pork chop and a dessert for two and six. What's the equivalent of two and six now? For 12p. I remember that joint, the caterpillars in the salad. Yeah, we needed the protein. <laughs> Any protein was appreciated. In those days of graft, you lived in my old stamping ground, Earl's Court, for a while, didn't you? Yes, that used to be known as Kangaroo Valley. Uh, that was where the Australian club was. It was always full of Aussies, masses. I lived in about five addresses in Earl's Court, but it was always difficult to get um, lodgings in Earl's Court if you were an actor. <coughs> they used to have uh, the, um, the signs in, in the newspaper windows. I mean, it's for Vera, who'd like to thrash things out now, you know, or Swedish massage. Then it was for bed sitting rooms. And it always said in this order, no Irish, blacks, dogs or actors need apply. And we, we couldn't even get billing above dogs. <laughs> I always remember that. Irish, black, that was the order. Irish, blacks, dogs or actors. How do you find living in London these days? Well, it's great if you live in a high rise because there are no other, other high rises around, you see. You can live on the 57th floor in New York and be staring into someone's uh, kitchen. You know, I've, I've done it all the time. You say, oh, the 57th floor, we'll see forever. Get up there, there's a guy looking at you, doing an omelette, you know? Uh, and in, in London, I only live around the 11th or 12th floor, and I can see everything for miles. I, uh, um, the great thing, too, in, in Britain, where the weather is very changeable, is you can see the weather coming for miles. That's a that's a thing about that I really teed off. I lived in Paris for a long time. And the, the reputation of London is one of a sort of cold place where it always pours with rain. And Paris is all these lovers walking about the sunshine with uh, uh, chestnuts in blossom and all that. And I checked the rainfall. And the rainfall in London is 22.5 inches a year. And the rainfall in Paris is 22.9. So for 0.4 of an inch of rain, we are this cold, dreadful place, and everyone's walking around in Paris kissing and cuddling under chestnut blossoms. And chestnuts also don't come out in May like the song, the song said, they come out in June. I used to think there were a lot of eccentrics in London, but it turned out I was wrong. They're all eccentrics in London. Everyone's eccentric in London. Yeah. Everyone is off his rocker here. And I think it's, um, it can't be inbreeding <laughs> because it's... it's nationality in the world but um, I what I think it is is I think people who decide to stay here are off their rocker and foreigners who decide decide to come here are off their rocker I mean like yourself I mean you are off your <laughs> rocker <laughs> you live here you know and you'll see you speak to any foreigner who lives here he's off his rocker is it something about the place yeah and it, it's and also is if you are off your rocker and you don't want to be stared at this is the place to come because no one takes any notice what Michael forgot to mention is that not everyone in London goes potty on his own. Some of them form groups. At the Royal Academy in Roma, the London Tops get together to raise funds for good causes. Thirty years ago, I was very suspicious of the London Tops, partly because they had visible means of support, which I visibly lacked. As time went by, my attitude softened along with my waistline. I came to believe that if there had to be an upper crust, London's was at least crinkly, not to say kinky. Now at last, the moment had arrived to call a truce and spend one solitary evening with the upper orders. The London social scene abounds with amiable hunters, and it's hard to keep even the normal ones out of costume. Carolyn has been doing ace work with our intermediary. No, madam, no.
The Princess Di of my generation, Princess Alexandra, was graciously in attendance. I wanted to look my best, which nowadays entails covering up my face. <laughs> Paranoia soon faded, however. As social high flyer Bubbles Rothermere explained, nobody was going to check my credentials. Has the London social scene changed in the time you've known it? Oh, yes. A lot. It's um, much more um, free and easy. I mean, you know, money can get in anywhere now. Well, as Debbie is the one. But Debbie's yeah. on things over, isn't it? Debs, things over. And um, I think there's a shortage of men here, real men. You know, after New York, I mean, I met more men in New York in two months than in five years here. I like that. I'm really good looking men that earn two million dollars in Wall Street. And, and yeah. <laughs> real men, huh? Real. Uh, well, they, they're goers, they're winners, you see. Here, they relax and they just tend to sit on their heels and say, well, I've done this, I've done that, and you know. You know well, they have lunches that are too long. You drink lunchtime, you're dead. I hate lunches. I tell you what, what's fun is winning, yeah. talent. And that's what I have when I have a party. They like to fill the room with winners. Uh -huh. And they can be winners in finance, they can be winners in actors, they can be anything. They've got, it's got to, got to be fun, they've got to contribute, and they beat off each other, you know? They bounce off each other. You get, you get one person that's dull, got a chip on his shoulder, and it kills the whole thing. So what do you do with him? You need to invite them. <laughs> <laughs> Bubbles left me only marginally worried about whether I was a real man. The atmosphere was too affable for anxiety. I suppose this sort of thing happens in Copenhagen or Cologne, but they'd be more self-conscious about it. Londoners usually don't care how odd they look, and that can be very relaxing. London's aristocrats basically wear old sweaters when at home and out-of-date dinner jackets when they dress up, thereby remaining within hailing distance, at least visually, of people who sleep under the festival hall in cardboard boxes. At dinner, I drew a place between two charming titled ladies who immediately relaxed me by telling me that they had not only heard of Australia, but large parts of it had been owned by their families for generations. In Vienna, I would have had to spend a lot of time kissing hands in German, and in Japan, just saying hello would have taken half an hour and a slipped disc. This was more like a picnic. There was a time when, with my nose pressed to the glass, I would have condemned this spectacle as a galloping case of conspicuous consumption. But nowadays, if absolutely forced to at gunpoint, I am ready to sample the odd strawberry or twelve, striving as I do to quell the inner voice that cries, where was all this healthy food when I was still eating at Nick the Greeks? I was already on my second lot of strawberries before the others had finished toying with their medallions of marinated peasant a la peasant flambe. This is the moment you've all been waiting for with such impatience. To hail, first of all, Jane Edwards, who arranged and got the... The raffle draw was organized in the same disarmingly amateur spirit as the Dardanelles campaign or an England test cricket tour. I'd been to the same sort of event in Los Angeles and sat around awed and bored while some film star accompanied by a hundred-piece orchestra proved that senility was not enough to stop him dancing. This was a bit of a shambles by comparison and far preferable. Veronica. Veronica will um, make We spin the wheel. Yeah. Okay. The occasion was exclusive, 
only in the sense that it excluded anybody who had the slightest clue about how to run a raffle. Otherwise, practically anybody could get in. London, at its best, will tolerate almost anyone. If nature has ordained that you will strike your fellow men as something of a rare bird, you can stay in your hometown and have rocks thrown at you by the local youth, or you can come to London and develop your quirks into a style. Even if you aren't hailed as a pace setter, at least you'll be part of the scene, part of the city. And London is the city of cities. Paris is more elegant if you don't mind the price tag, New York more glitzy if you don't mind being mugged, Rio more romantic if you don't mind being mugged again by the ambulance driver. But only Athens has more Greek sculptures, only Florence has more Italian paintings, and only India has more Indian restaurants, because only London collects everything from everywhere. London is the world in one place, and if it seems more serious now than it was when my lot was starting off, perhaps we're more serious, and London hasn't changed at all, but is just working its eternal trick of showing the next generation that the possibilities are infinite, and everything has begun again. Coming up next, a preview of next week's postcard. Then at 9, part 3 of Battlefield, the Battle of Midway fought entirely by aircraft in 1942 between the United States and Japan. And at no stage did the two warring fleets come within sight of each other. Find out how the United States achieved supremacy in the Pacific, next on 13. Stay with us. The presentation of this program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you.